Are dairy products necessary for human health? That's a good question. So we want to know, what does the science say? And notice I will always use the expression dairy products. They're not foods. Dairy products are advanced in Western countries as necessary for human health, but these recommendations are the result of very aggressive marketing by the dairy industry. They are absolutely not supported by any science whatsoever. And uh, this is a quote from the book of Daniel in the Bible. Uh, Daniel and his companions ask, give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. So in the first chapter of Daniel, verse 12, good advice then, even better advice now. So how old is uh, the human species, modern human beings, homo sapiens sapiens? Well, according to evolutionary theory, modern humans are 100,000 years old. That's how long uh, modern humans have been around. Well, then let me ask you, how long has the practice of dairying been around? And that is using other species milk for uh, consumption by human beings? Well, less than 6,000 years. So think about that. If human beings have been around for 100,000 years, but the practice of sucking on the tits of another animal has only been around for 6,000 years, the question naturally comes, then if these products are so essential for our health, how did we survive as a species for over 94,000 years without them? Well, we survived because clearly they are not essential. And uh, I just want you to notice some things. Look at the butts of these cows. You see the feces everywhere? You notice how they're in and around the udders? That's how they get into the milk and by, from the milk, the ice cream, the cheese, the yogurt, and everything else that's made from that milk. Uh, there is nothing sanitary about the practice of dairying. So if you're drinking milk or eating anything made from that milk, you're getting a healthy load of manure. All right, well, let's just briefly talk, review some dietary patterns of health. An article entitled Dietary Patterns and Mortality, Common Threads and Consistent Results, published in the Journal of Nutrition in April of 2014, reviewed four dietary patterns uh, around the world that were associated with a lower risk of death from heart disease, cancer, and uh, death from any other cause. Take-home message is if you want to reduce your risk of dying from any cause, you need to eat a plant-based diet. Diets that were rich in plant foods, meaning whole grains, variety of fruit and vegetables, nuts and legumes, uh, was shown to reduce the risk of dying from any cause and was supported by extensive scientific research. Blue zone data from, uh, again, around the world showed that uh, worldwide populations consuming either a primarily or entirely plant-based diet have the lowest risk for chronic disease, dementia, mood and behavior disorders, uh, and also the greatest longevity. And interestingly, the closer a population gets to a entirely plant-based diet, the longer they live and the lower their risk for chronic disease. Now, there were four uh, blue zones identified around the world, um, and there's only one blue zone identified within the United States. That blue zone is in the United States. It's in Loma Linda, California, where a population of Seventh-day Adventist uh, vegetarians and vegans live. And it turns out that within the four blue zones, the Seventh-day Adventists are the ones who actually live the longest of all uh, the individuals within the Blue Zones. They uh, live on average longer than even the Okinawans. And within the United States, some of the Adventist men live uh, nine and a half years longer than the average American man. And the women live 6.6 6 .6 years longer than the average American woman. That does not mean that being plant-based is better for men than women. It's just that women, you guys already outlive us so long that there's just less room for improvement. <laughs> We have uh, voluminous uh, research that is very, very consistent. Plant-based diets have been consistently shown in medical research over the last 60 plus years to decrease risk for all of these chronic diseases, uh, as well as cancers, hypertension, strokes, autoimmune diseases, and obesity. Medical research has shown that the roots of adult chronic diseases are formed in childhood. Studies show that children fed diets high in red meat, animal protein, and dairy products have, are at increased risk for heart disease and hormone-related cancers, such as breast and prostate cancers, as adults 
and can have up to triple the risk for colorectal cancer as long as 65 years after exposure. And again, I'm emphasizing this, ladies and gentlemen, because if you don't care about yourself, you ought to care about your children and grandchildren. OK, so, you know, you might say, well, I don't care. I'm going to go get that triple bacon cheeseburger. But darn it, should you be feeding it to your babies? Uh, studies have also consistently shown obese kids equal obese adults. Autopsy studies, studies on children eating the standard American diets that have been killed in accidents show that uh, they have the beginnings of art, uh, coronary artery disease uh, as the young as 12 to 13 years of age. In the summary of its, uh, the third expert report that was published in 2012, sponsored by the World Cancer Research Fund in conjunction with the American Institute for Cancer Research, the report again emphasized the link between preventable dietary exposures and cancer risk. So again, this is yet another uh, uh, research body that is showing the same thing. Dietary, physiologic, and lifestyle factors that were shown to increase risk for cancer were red and processed meats, heme iron, iron which comes from meat, uh, high levels of sodium, alcohol, obesity, chronic inflammation, and a lack of regular exercise. Protective dietary components were vegetables and fruit, whole grains, legumes, both soluble and insoluble dietary fiber, plant-derived vitamins and antioxidants such as vitamin C, E, and selenium and folate, and phytochemicals such as carotenoids, uh, dithiothiol, I'm not even going to try to say that. Isocyanates, flavonoids, phenols, to name a few. In addition, the uh, report urged the elimination of calorie-dense, high-energy foods like sugar-sweetened beverages and foods high in total and saturated fat, both to lower disease risk and reduce obesity. Now, just a little uh, uh, word that does not mean you should never have a piece of birthday cake or, uh, uh, you know, some lemonade, but it's not something you should be doing every day on a regular basis. All right, well, let's talk about milk, shall we? And uh, up here, you can see a chart that uh, shows you milks of different species. And what I want you to see is that at the top here, I have a bunch of carnivores, and at the bottom, I have two plant-based species. And what I want you to notice uh, immediately is that the carnivores all have milks that are much higher in both protein and fat content. Why is that? That's because carnivore infants are born at a very immature state of development because clearly uh, pregnant female carnivores can't be out hunting with a giant belly full of babies. They would kill themselves and their babies. So their babies are born at a very immature level uh, uh, of development and essentially complete their development outside the womb. As a result, they need a lot more protein and a lot more energy to uh, complete that development. Um, now... Interestingly, when you look at the cow and the human, which are both herbivores, you see that they have um, pretty much the same amount of total solids in the milk, 12.3, 12, 12 uh, versus 12. They have essentially the same amount of fat. Cow's milk has 3.6% fat. Human milk has 3.7% fat, right? But the type of fat is completely different. Why do I say that? Well, you can churn milk, I mean, uh, butter from cow's milk, and you can make ice cream from cow's milk, but you can't do that from human milk. Anybody out here ever seen human milk? You notice that it's very thin looking, right? Whereas whole cow's milk is very opaque and very white. That's because the fat that's in cow's milk is very saturated. And if you separate that fat, it will form cream and become solid at room temperature, whereas the fat that's in human milk is very unsaturated and does not become solid at room temperature. Now, look at the amount of protein. The amount of protein in cow's milk is almost three times what it is in human milk. Why is that? That's because baby calves grow much faster than baby humans. Humans are the slowest growing um, uh, animals, uh, terrestrial animals on the planet. Uh, we take 20, uh, essentially 18 to 20 years to reach full maturity, whereas a baby calf, by its first birthday, will be 
grow from about 80 pounds to close to 600 pounds. And so they need a lot more protein. But now let's look at the amount of sugar, which is the lactose that's in the uh, milk. Human milk has one and a half times as much sugar as um, cow's milk. Why is that? Well, the human, br well, actually any brain only uses carbohydrate or sugar for its metabolism. And proportionately, humans have the largest brains of any species on the planet. And as a result, uh, the baby needs a lot more sugar for its brain. And that's why there's more sugar in human breast milk. And when humans feed their babies cow's milk, not only are they harming their baby in a number of different ways, but they're relatively starving that baby's brain for the uh, uh, energy that it needs. So what are some other health uh, problems associated with cow's milk? Well, because uh, uh, cow's milk can exacerbate or it's designed to stimulate immune development, it can actually overstimulate an immune system and exacerbate problems with asthma. Now, what is one of the primary ways that our respiratory system protects itself from infections? Somebody out there tell me. Well, inflammation, but what does that inflammation do? What, how does your respiratory tree keep itself clear of dust, dirt, bacteria? Mucus, Mucus exactly. Lines itself with mucus, the mucus traps the bacteria in the dirt and you either spit it, cough it out, or you swallow it. Well, what happens when you overstimulate mucus production? You start to clog up your respiratory tree and that's what drinking cow's milk will do. It overstimulates the production of mucus and that can clog up the respiratory tree and exacerbate the symptoms of asthma. It also can make sinusitis worse because again, overproduces mucus that will uh, cause uh, the sinus uh, uh, cavities to become clogged. Uh, in places where people eat a lot of dairy foods, type 1 diabetes is off the charts. And that's because proteins in the proteins that are in cow's milk uh, can be broken down into um, protein fragments that stimulate the immune system to make antibodies that can destroy insulin producing cells in the pancreas. Um, it, the uh, inflammatory components of cow's milk can also uh, cause the overproduction of acne or exacerbate acne. And the allergy that people can develop to cow's milk proteins can uh, inflame the uh, intestinal tract to the point that people will um, uh, develop uh, constipation, uh, they can develop anemia, and uh, they also can end up with these rashes uh, that babies sometimes get. Well, what about bone health, right? Because that's why we we're all told that we need to drink cow's milk because supposedly it makes strong bones. And ideally, we don't want to end up like these birds on the boneless chicken ranch, <laughs> right? They can't walk because they don't have any bones. Well, um, so let me, let me ask you, is, is milk a good way to get calcium? So there's calcium in milk, right? Does everybody agree there's calcium in milk? Yes. Where does it come from? Do the cows drink milk? Are they drinking each other's milk? Is that how they're getting their calcium? No. They get it from the plants. Aggressive marketing by dairy industry suggests that the best way to get your calcium is by drinking cow's milk. That's foolishness, and that's based on marketing. There's no science behind it. Dairy calcium has never been shown to protect anybody's bones at all. In fact, the Harvard Nurses Health Study showed that the women who drank the most milk had the highest risk for hip fracture, and that's because there's so much protein in that uh, 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 milk that it actually weakens their bones and makes them uh, at more at risk for fracture. Um, a variety of plant foods contain abundant calcium. Cows get calcium from the green plants that they eat. And you see, I, I've shown you a picture of several deer, including an adult moose. Now, there's, somebody, there's at least one man in this room who is six feet tall. And if I were to take that man and flay all of the skin and muscle off his skeleton and just weigh his bones, his, the bones of his skeleton would weigh 25 pounds. Now, if I took the antlers from that adult moose you guys are looking at and weighed those antlers, which are made out of solid bone, they would weigh 85 pounds. 
Now, this six foot guy, which this gentleman sitting right over here in front of me, put, raise your hand, sir. Yeah, yeah, the, you just turned your head. Yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> How tall are you? Five eleven. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, come on. You should have lied. Okay. So, who's six? Who's six feet tall? All right. Raise your hand. All right. He's six feet tall. Took him at least uh, 18, 20 years to get that tall. If I weighed his bones alone, they'd weigh 25 pounds. If I, weigh, if I weighed the antlers on that moose, they would weigh 80 to 85 pounds. That moose grows those antlers in three months, eating nothing but green plants. And they're made out of solid bone. There's plenty of calcium in green plants. You don't need to drink milk. So my point, you drink milk, you just might have osteoporosis. So the point is this. If you think about it, all the animals and all the other humans in the world show that liquid sources of calcium are not the best way to obtain calcium throughout your lifetime or build a strong adult skeleton because milk is for babies. Like the skeleton, just saying. All right, so let's look at the association of hip fracture and milk consumption. Again, look at the countries around the world, drinking, uh, consuming the most dairy, higher risk for hip fracture. And again, it's because the animal protein leaches calcium from our skeletons. Uh, again, when you look at animal protein intake versus fracture risk, same type of curve. More animal protein, higher the risk for uh, uh, um, fractures. Uh, our bodies don't store any protein, so there's no advantage for uh, uh, consuming protein in excess of your daily needs. All protein that's not utilized for uh, homeostatic pur purposes, in other words, it's not incorporated into either muscle or used to replace, uh, it's converted into carbohydrate. And as these animal proteins are converted into carbohydrate, the uh, sulfur comes off as a uh, weak acid. And in excreting that acid, um, our kidney loses the ability to retrieve calcium from our urine. And then the calcium is then uh, taken out of our skeleton. Uh, and phosphorus is also mobilized from the skeleton to neutralize the acid. And over a lifetime, we can lose a lot of calcium. Plant proteins don't cause the same problem because they are already buffered by phosphate and don't promote the same type of calcium loss. As a result, studies have shown that uh, women who eat a plant-based diet have uh, higher bone mineral both before and after menopause than women who eat meat. So if you want a strong skeleton, you need to be plant-based. In countries that uh, consume the most milk, they have the highest incidence of type 1 diabetes. And again, that's because, as I mentioned before, uh, these cow's milk proteins are broken down into fragments that stimulate the body to make antibodies that destroy the uh, insulin-producing beta cells in the pancreas, and that will then cause type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune-type disease. And uh, this is an association of milk consumption with uh, multiple sclerosis. The baby is born with a very immature what? Immune system, right? So the other thing that the milk is supposed to do is stimulate the development of the baby's immune system. But if you already have an intact immune system and you start overstimulating it, what does that lead it to do? To attack your own body. All right. So what's in cow's milk? There's hormones, both natural and synthetic. Um, there's pus. There's blood. There's the feces we looked at. There's uh, PCBs, polychloral biphenyls, and other POPs, persistent organopollutants. Uh, there are flame retardants, pesticide residues, the antibiotics. They feed these animals, try to keep them from getting sick. And these uh, bovine proteins, uh, whey and uh, casein that I, that I spoke about that can cause these allergic problems. So... There are plenty of plant-based milks that are very delicious and nutritious so that you don't need uh, um, animal protein, I mean, an, um, cow's milk or, or other uh, milk from other animals. Uh, there's soy, oat, hemp, almond, cashew, and rice. Um, and uh, there's even pea and flax, uh, flaxseed milk. Um, I've been told that when it comes to replacing milk for rest, uh, cooking and baking, that oat milk is excellent. Uh, it's better to eat your calcium as opposed to drink it. Um, you can see you can get calcium from tofu, uh, collard greens, chia seeds, 
uh, fortified plant mix, milked kale, almonds, uh, dried figs, broccoli, and other uh, cruciferous vegetables like cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, uh, fortified orange juice, and yeah, you know, they put the black strap molasses there, but who, who in God's name eats molasses these days? <laughs> All right. Well, a word about uh, lactose intolerance. You can see around the world, the majority of people in, on, on this planet are lactose intolerant. That's because, as with most mammals, most humans stop making the enzyme to digest lactose uh, once we become adults and we stop and we become weaned. Um, lactase or lactose, which is the sugar that's in milk, is a disaccharide, meaning it's two individual sugar molecules that are joined together. And in order to absorb the sugar, you have to split those two sugar molecules into the individual uh, sugars so that you can absorb them. Um, the enzyme that splits them is called lactase. All babies make lactase, but once you stop nursing, you stop making the enzyme uh, because you shouldn't be, well, if you're um, putting your mouth on a breast, it's usually not for nursing purposes. Um, <laughs> tried to say that as delicate, delicately as I could. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, and it, it's only in a very small number of, of uh, people around the world that uh, they have uh, uh, become what are called last lactase persisters. But as you can see, in uh, uh, African countries, in Asian countries, um, uh, the, uh, most of the, the uh, and, uh, uh, people in those places uh, do not uh, continue to make uh, lactose. Or lactase, excuse me. So uh, I asked the question, if you got milk, then you just may have lactose intolerance. And uh, if you look at this picture that's coming up, you can see that these poor people of color with their milk mustaches are struggling to get into this bathroom because they've got trouble. They drink milk and uh, boy, are they in trouble. Our body does not use protein for energy, okay? So protein is important for the same reason wood is important in your house and brick is important in your house. Those things are important because you don't use those for energy. You don't burn them in your fireplace. You use them to build your home. So we're going to look at uh, protein uh, and discuss it in terms of building a house. So building materials at the rate they're being utilized. In other words, you only need to consume protein at the rate it's being utilized. Human milk has the lowest protein content of any milk of any animal on this planet because we're the slowest growing. We don't need a lot of protein because we're very slow growing. Well, what happens once you complete your building? Do you still need semis bringing you in all this building material? You guys look confused. I need an answer. No. Because once your, your house is built, you don't need all this stuff being dumped in the front yard. You can't use it. At that point, you only need a piece of sheetrock if some... Your drunk uncle comes over and punches a hole in the wall. <laughs> or you only need tiles if the storm comes through and, and, and causes damage to the roof. At that point, you only replace what's needed. So you need a lot less protein once you have an adult body. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Well, what happens if you just say, I don't give a damn. I'm going to keep eat, bringing in a lot of building materials. You end up with a giant pile of rubber, rubble, and an organic pile of rubble is a tumor. This is why people develop these benign tumors like lipomas, okay, because they're still eating all this protein and your body has nothing to do with it but do something, or uterine fibroids, or cystic tumors in the breast, or skin tumors or a prostate the size of New Jersey, or, you know, these uh, benign tumors on the vocal cords, or worse, you get what you can call bizarre additions, which are cancers. That's why animal protein is associated with development of cancers. Colon cancer, kidney cancer, breast cancer, liver cancer. Animal protein has been linked to heart disease, uh, cancer of the prostate, breast, colon, pancreas, diabetes, osteoporosis, 
Prion diseases like mad cow uh, disease, Alzheimer's, other dementias, high blood pressure, stroke, uh, exacerbation and acceleration of kidney failure, kidney stones, dysentery and other foodborne illnesses. Uh, it, uh, uh, as I said, a protein cancer promoter uh, in putrefaction of animal protein in human colon releases toxins that can exacerbate behavioral disorders such as ADHD, uh, depression, anxiety. Um, uh, it uh, increases amounts of something called homocysteine, which uh, increases your risk for dementia and uh, weakens your bones and damages your blood vessels and leads to heart disease, stroke, and osteoporosis. All right. <clears throat> Well, you miss the wrong signals, that can lead to disaster, clearly. So let me ask you something. Are these animals meat eaters or plant eaters? Does there, all right, I heard plant eaters over here. Does anybody over here disagree? No. So then at what point in these animals' lives do they eat animal protein? All right, someone over here said they don't. Do you agree? Okay, at what point in their lives do they eat animal protein? When they're babies, absolutely. So what does that mean? <laughs> that means that animal protein in a plant-eating animal is a growth signal. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most important points I want you to take home from this lecture. That's why animal protein is dangerous and unhealthy for human beings. Because every time you put animal protein in your body, it stimulates your cells to try and grow. And your cells should not be trying to grow. When they try to grow, they only have one thing that they can do, either form a benign tumor or a cancer. Is that crystal clear to you? So again, herbivorous animals should only be exposed to animal protein when they're babies. Animal protein is a potent growth signal. And uh, when we're exposed to animal protein as adults, it turns on growth genes, which in adults are cancer-causing genes and causes cancer transformation in our cells. And this brings up my other point, and that is that the early nutrition researchers got everything bass backwards and completely wrong. When they looked at animal protein versus uh, plant proteins, they said the animal proteins had better quality than the plant proteins because the animal proteins had higher amounts of the essential amino acids than the plant proteins. And they thought that that meant the animal proteins were better for us. But that was completely backwards. And so that led to some common myths and uh, uh, misconceptions perceptions that you can't get enough uh, protein on uh, plant-based diets, that plant proteins were not complete. That is flatly not true. Every plant protein has all the uh, amino acids that you need, that calcium was hard to come by, that it was difficult to build muscle on a vegan diet. Um, I would have uh, Corin stand up, but you guys saw him earlier. Uh, you can build plenty of muscle on a plant-based diet. Um, all right. So, uh, again, Animal protein does have more essential amino acids, but the reason it has those essential amino acids is because that is what stimulates growth. When you become an adult, you don't need all of those essential amino acids because you shouldn't be trying to grow. And they assume that the closer in composition to our own tissues that a protein was, the better quality. Again, that means if, if you take that line of reasoning to its logical conclusion, that means that instead of eating chickens or potatoes or beans, I should be eating dillop. Um, <laughs> because he has the exact amino acid composition that my tissues do. That's a stupid way of thinking. You don't need the same amino acid composition to be healthy. Um, for herbivorous animals, as we said, animal protein is a growth signal, and we don't need that. Uh, animal protein turns on genes that are called TOR genes, which uh, are master growth genes that signal our bodies to grow. Um, and uh, TOR genes function as master regulatory genes uh, for growth, and these genes should only be active when we are infants and growing rapidly. Uh, animal protein not only increases the uh, TOR activity, it's the essential uh, amino acid leucine that has the greatest effect in this regard. And I'm going to show you something about the difference between animal and plant protein and leucine in a minute. Decreasing animal protein intake not only decreases TOR activity, suppresses something called 
insulin-like growth factor one level, which is a hormone, because when your liver sees animal protein, it starts increasing the amount of IGF-1 it produces. But IGF-1, we know, also increases uh, uh, cancer risk, and cancer uh, cells are covered with IG on, IGF-1 receptors. Um, IGF-1 levels have been shown to be 9 to 13% lower in men and women who are on plant-based diets compared to meat eaters. In a landmark study with uh, uh, looking at people with higher animal protein intake, those people had a 75% higher overall mortality over an 18-year period and a four-fold higher increase in, uh, uh, in cancer death over that 18-year period. So clearly, ladies and gentlemen, this, the science is clear. You eat animal protein, you're going to die much quicker. I mean, we're all going to die eventually. <laughs> all right. This is showing you the differences in leucine content between plant foods and animal uh, uh, products or tissues. Okay. And what you see is that dairy products, eggs, and animal muscle is very high in leucine. And again, remember, leucine turns on those growth genes. Well, dairy products, it makes sense. You want baby mammals to be growing. You want that leucine to get in there, turn on those growth genes. But once that, you know, cow, human, horse, giraffe becomes an adult and starts eating their normal food, which is grains or carrots or legumes, they shouldn't be turning on those growth genes and look at how much less leucine is in those foods. It's enough to keep them healthy, but not so much that it turns on the cancer genes. Is that clear? That's why these foods are so much healthier. So you don't want to try and mimic animal tissue. That is not good for you. That will cause cancer. All right, and it will also increase these IGF-1 levels. Animal uh, proteins also have a much higher uh, co content of methionine, which is a sulfur-containing amino acid that actually ages your mitochondria and causes them to become oxidized and, uh, and uh, malfunctioning, whereas the primary sulfur-containing amino acid in beans and other plant foods is cysteine, which uh, doesn't uh, damage your mitochondria but does boost your immune function. All right, animal protein accelerates kidney damage, increases heart disease, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, uh, inflammation, bone loss, and so forth. Some of the growth promoters that uh, uh, animal producers uh, feed to their animals. In 1979, there was an epidemic of breast enlargement in Italian children. They traced it back to the use of synthetic estrogens in uh, uh, animal production. Over in Europe, they had the good sense to stop using these growth promoters. Here in the United States, we still use them. That's why the European Union will not import American beef uh, uh, and feed it to their, their people. Um, but these estrogenic growth uh, promoters such as uh, Xeranol, um, um, they help the, the uh, cows uh, grow faster and put on more weight, but they also persist in their tissues and can cause, uh, again, estrogenic uh, um, uh, tissue development in the people that, uh, that eat these foods. Um, and uh, unlike the uh, plant estrogens, which are actually healthy for us and protect us against the disease, these things can increase the risk for breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men. Um, and it says, in the absence of effects of uh, federal re regulation, the meat industry uses hundreds of animal feed additives with little or no concern about the carcinogenic and other toxic effects of d uh, dietary residues of these animals. And over the lifetime of Western women, they end up with uh, uh, estrogen exposure that is four times greater uh, than uh, rural Chinese women and a breast cancer risk that is five times greater because of the greater exposure of, uh, of the hormones that, that they're exposed to. Um, there are a number of vegan uh, and Olympic athletes and bodybuilders who are completely vegan because like the largest land animals on earth, they show that it's not necessarily eat flesh to make flesh. And this is uh, Malachi Davis, who was a British 400 uh, meter uh, runner in the uh, uh, Olympics. This is uh, Cara uh, Romero, an Olympic uh, soccer, soccer player. Uh, this is Mont Coleman. He's a vegan bodybuilder from Oakland, California, where I grew up. 
Uh, this is Kendrick Ferris. He's, uh, was on a USA uh, Olympic weightlifting team. This is Mario Catley, another uh, vegan bodybuilder from the West Coast. Uh, this is Rebecca Sony. She was an Olympic swimmer. This is Namai Delgado, uh, vegan bodybuilder. This is Derek Treesize, vegan bodybuilder. Uh, his wife is also a uh, vegan bodybuilder, um, Marcella Treesize. And this is Dancy Bosch, who's a sil uh, Olympic silver medal cyclist at the uh, London Games. Uh, this uh, was from a study that showed that fruits and vegetables uh, can preserve muscle mass and conditioning in both adolescents and elderly people. Um, and it, these uh, fruits and vegetables can prevent oxidative uh, post-exercise uh, uh, soreness and, and promote uh, faster muscle recovery um, uh, in uh, athletes. And then lastly, the future of professional sports is vegan because NFL star uh, Derek Morgan, who's a uh, uh, defensive back for the Tennessee Titans, went vegan and a number of his teammates decided to go vegan as well when they saw that his on-field performance uh, improved and his post-game uh, recovery also significantly improved. And uh, Novak Djokovic is a vegan and credits his on-court performance uh, with his vegan diet, with improving his on-court uh, performance and post-recovery uh, time. Tennis star Venus Will Williams is also a longtime vegan, credits her diet with helping to uh, reverse some of the effects of her Sjogren's disease. And there are a number of uh, NBA stars who are also uh, uh, vegans. And I'll just let this slide run through. And I'm out of time. Uh, so listen, guys, thank you so much for your time and attention.